In the last few years, we've seen some good cases of outrage mobs forming on Twitter, Facebook, etc., and going after a person for some reason or another. I think it would be useful to talk about outrage mobs, what they do in practice, who they've victimized, who they haven't victimized, and what can be done about them in the future without violating people's rights. For the sake of clarity, my working definition of outrage mobs is a group of people online who are convinced of some moral fault within a person and then they endeavor to get this person fired and to ruin that person's life. The mob morality changes all the time, and usually the victim doesn't know they've crossed a line until it's far too late. Now, by morality, I don't mean a 1950s traditionalist morality. I mean progressive, intersectional, and politically correct morality, which is what we see more often than not. When we get to the list of mob victims, you'll see what I mean. The most common sin you will find is one of giving offense to the woke SJW crowd. Now, mobs often serve as their own prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner, and they definitely want to help execute the person. They can target and ruin anyone, and the people that they target and destroy, and the logic that they use doesn't need to have any continuity. Who gets destroyed today is in no way indicative of who they might destroy tomorrow. They are different from people asking for official investigations or those petitioning for legal or proper intervention. Mobs want blood and they want it fast. They get blood when they apply enough pressure to corporations to either fire the individual or pull their sponsorships or deny the individual a chance to ever work in their field again. The end result of a mob is that someone has been destroyed or come close to it and it's almost always someone innocent of any real crime. Mobs rarely get it right, and even if they do get a verdict correct, their methodology is still wrong. Harvey Weinstein definitely needed to be charged with a crime from a legal standpoint, and the mob was probably right that he's guilty, but they lynched him and others who may or may not be guilty without due process. Rallying for investigations and due process isn't a mob thing because such a rally has no intent of carrying out its own justice. Mobs want to carry out their own justice. I started thinking and scripting about outrage mobs about the time James Gunn got fired by Disney. That thought process led me to Kathy Griffin, another controversial figure, and then to Roseanne Barr. The problem is that I don't believe that Kathy Griffin, Roseanne Barr, or James Gunn are victims of online outrage mobs. In all cases, they were fired the day after their respective scandals broke, which could easily mean that the decision to fire them was handed down the day of the scandal, or at least decided on that same day. In Roseanne's case, it was tweets from the night before that resulted in her being fired before lunchtime on the West Coast. And that happened the very next day, roughly within about 18 hours. The news reported it within 24 hours in each case, meaning that things happened very, very quickly behind the scenes, faster than a mob could form and reach peak outrage. Given how fast Roseanne went up in smoke, it's not unreasonable to assume that similarly rapid timelines would apply to the Gunn and Griffin cases. They too may well have been fired within hours of their sins going public. It's important to remember that just because a few loud voices go aggro on Twitter doesn't necessarily mean a company's inbox is being flooded with hate mail and outrage. Outrage does take a little bit of time to build. Not much, but a little. I find it difficult to believe that peak outrage was reached in less than one day's time with Gunn, Barr, or Griffin and that it influenced their employers in such a short amount of time. It could be argued that CNN, ABC, or Disney feared potential mobs, but that's theory only. Swarms of angry people did form online for and against some of these figures, but that didn't affect the consequences that these figures faced. This is significant because I believe it's important to recognize when a mob is to blame and when they are not. Sometimes people do things to get themselves fired and make people angry all at once, and that doesn't mean that they're just an innocent mob victim. Mob victims are a pattern, yes, but it is important to recognize cases that do not fit the pattern, and that's much trickier. A case that doesn't fit the pattern might also be something like where a company makes a business decision that customers don't like and there's pushback for that decision, like if McDonald's took McMuffins off the menu. <laughs> or the real-life example of when consumer pressure caused them to stop using chicken that had been raised with heavy-duty antibiotics. These are not examples of moral mobs trying to destroy a person, but rather a customer base lobbying for a company change. So these cases wouldn't be a case of mob outrage against a victim. However, we do have some outrage mob victims that have a much clearer connection between something they said or did and the rise of an angry mob that was offended and the consequences that that mob caused for the offending individual. In some of these cases, you can note that the company and the person working for the company faced backlash over the person's beliefs or behavior, 
failure, none of which, though, affected the actual product the company created. This is about violated morality, not changed products. Keep that in mind as we go. So here's a short list of a few victims of outrage mobs. Kevin Williamson attempted to make a point about abortion being murder. Not a completely unreasonable point, though the way he made it was pretty edgy to some. He was hired by The Atlantic to come on board as one of their writers, but he later wrote that, quote, In no time, the abortion rights group NARAL was organizing protests against me, demanding that I not be permitted to publish in The Atlantic. Opinion pieces denouncing me appeared in the New York Times, The Washington Post, The New Republic, Slate, Huffington Post, Mother Jones, The Guardian, and other publications. The pressure did work. The Atlantic let him go in less than a week. There's also the case of Dr. Walter Palmer. He was a dentist who went on a safari and shot the wrong lion and became the target of an online mob helped along by humanitarians such as Jimmy Kimmel and Mia Farrow. Kimmel personally vilified the dentist in front of the American public. He failed to do that for Kermit Gosnell for some reason. And Mia Farrow tweeted out the dentist's address and encouraged people to target him, which they did, to the point where he started receiving death threats, so he closed his practice and went into hiding for a while. Ironically, the lion population became problematically large because of the Cecil effect, but the mob wasn't around for that problem. This guy had his life ruined over a lion he shot in a country that now has too many lions. Oh, the irony. Perhaps one of the most famous cases of the 2000s would be the Duke lacrosse team. They were the target of a horrifically biased prosecutor, a guy named Mike Nifong. He charged them with rape and then preached for local news media, which in turn helped inflame the local population and the national media against the players. Daniel Okrent later wrote that the case conformed too well to too many preconceived notions of too many in the press. White over black, rich over poor, athletes over non-athletes, men over women, educated over non-educated. In other words, it was the perfect social justice case of oppressor and oppressed. This likely created a positive feedback loop of anger and resentment against the lacrosse players, who eventually would have all charges against them dropped, and the DA that led the witch hunt was stripped of his position, disbarred, imprisoned, and sued. It is unfortunate that the lynch mob was so willfully fed by an elected official and, and that it infected a system that was supposed to be objective. Ironically, the media mob that went after the players turned on prosecutor Mike Nifong when it became apparent his case was a sham. I might add that the anger and outrage against Nifong wasn't really a morality mob because he's an elected official. He is held to a specific code as part of his job, and he is expected to represent the people and not violate their rights, all of which he failed at. Dr. Palmer, on the other hand, didn't do anything other than violate some snowflake sensibilities. But Mike Nifong failed his city and his duty to his constituents. So being angry at an elected public official over their behavior or speech is usually reasonable, and the outcome is through due process of elections, investigations, and so on. More recently, there was Papa John, who is arguably also an outrage mob victim, though it's a bit more complex than some of the other people on this list, partially because it involves business relationships, partnerships, and outside factors as well as the offending sin. His big crime was using the N-word and breaking the laws of political correctness as he complained about double standards of political correctness. Now, his assertions about Colonel Sanders may or may not be true, but his point was that the right people get away with being racists all the time. He might be onto something there. We should ask Tariq Nasheed. Additionally, Bill Maher has faced calls for disembowelment, or at least for his firing from HBO, from both sides for various infractions. He too used the N-word in a more caustic way than Papa John, but at least he still has his job, which kind of proves Papa John's point again. Anyway, some on the right also want his head after comments he's made about President Trump, and some on the left want his head for comments about Muslims. So far, the dude is living a charmed life and avoiding being destroyed by the mob, but that doesn't mean they haven't hunted him. Brendan Ike of Mozilla found himself on the wrong end of an outrage mob when 70,000 people called for his resignation over a non-work related belief in traditional marriage and for the thousand dollars he donated in the Proposition 8 campaign out in California. So in the two days before Ike resigned, protesters took to the streets in Oakland and San Francisco to block commuter buses in anger. I doubt they could do that now. There's too many needles and too much poop around. Ike eventually resigned under pressure and then went on to create a new browser called Brave. An older 
another case is the case of Chick-fil-A. Dan Cathy, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, once made remarks saying he supported traditional marriage and disapproved of gay marriage. And boy, were people mad. There was an attempt to organize a boycott of Chick-fil-A on a certain day, but despite all the huffing and puffing and boycott threats, a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day was organized at the same time as a sort of counter unboycott. The effect of the mob was drastic on Chick-fil-A. Their sales were about 30% higher for the day, later touted as one of their best ever, and sales were up about 12% that year for a total of $4.6 billion billion with a B dollars. Rasmussen polling found that 61% of voters viewed Chick-fil-A favorably and only 13% indicated they would participate in a boycott. Riggity, riggity, Rexon! Count Dankula is another soul the mobs came for, and as you probably know, he just missed out on jail time and ended up with a light duty fine. Even so, if you're watching this video, you no doubt saw the endless outrage directed at him over his joke video of a Nazi pug. And I have my doubts that such outrage did not influence some of the charges against him. Now, while there's only so much he could do in the face of degenerating and corrupt legal systems, there is something we can learn from Dank and even from Chick-fil-A and others. These cases of Count Dankula and Chick-fil-A show that mobs can be dealt with, often by taking them head on. The nature of a mob is that it's bold and ruthless, but at heart, the mob is a coward. They're only rioting because everyone else is there too. This isn't to say that mobs are harmless, but my feeling is that they've got a lot less power than most corporations think they do. Chick-fil-A's refusal to back down gained them support and it was a victory for the company. The backlash, well, it's largely been forgotten. But that doesn't stop companies and people fearing that backlash will cost them social justice points, virtue, and thus, most importantly, money, because often this is about money. They fear that these mobs can influence how people spend money in the form of boycotts and so on. The real truth just might be that mobs online represent bored, outraged internet monkeys who don't actually have spending power, who may not even be able to influence the spending power of others. These online mobs might be feared over financial sway and influence that they don't even have. That being said, I think it's okay to be upset when mobs get their way. That's probably one of the better positions to take, really, to be angry that a mob destroyed or tried to destroy a person's life outside of due process and real justice. The goal then really is to disempower mobs, not to suppress the freedoms of any of those involved. The best path forward is not to be part of internet virtue mobs and instead to encourage corporations and companies just to ignore them. It might just be that the only reason Twitter and internet outrage mobs have any power is because people treat them as if they have power. It's like a boogeyman that can only get you if you believe he can get you. Another great weapon against the mob is well-placed apathy. This comes from the sacred writings of the great Saint Dinkula, Holy martyr of free speech, when he looked into the outraged faces of soy and spake he to them verily saying, don't care, virgin. Newseum has a shirt that says fake news. Don't care. Bill Maher said something offensive. Don't care. A business figure supports traditional marriage. Still don't care. See how easy that is? Taking the time to be informed, finding the emotion and energy to be outraged, and then making sure it's worth engaging over is a bit of a process. Or it should be, so that we don't walk around mad at the world all the time. I would argue that our time and our outrage and emotion matter most when we use them carefully and selectively and place them on things of true significance. This means not destroying people for various moral infractions or being angry that some random person believes differently than we do. And then believing that they are going to destroy the country from their position as actors or pizza makers. Maybe we just have thin skin. Maybe we're mad at too much and mad at the wrong things at that. Maybe being judicious with our anger would help make it worth a darn. In the meantime, maybe it would just cool off the hotheads and the outrage mobs that are quickly becoming just another part of our society. <laughs>